Question one, if s equals four, what is the value of 20s minus 15s? Now you might be able to just do this in your head because 20 times four is 80, minus 15 times four is 60. And so 80 minus 60 is gonna be 20. You might have also noticed that if you factor out an s, you're gonna be left with 20 minus 15. So the question is really asking, what is s times five? And if s is four, four times five is gonna also be 20. So whatever is faster for you, that's the best way to do it, and that's the answer. Question two, the line graph shows the number of space shuttle launches by the US from 1981 through 1986. So we have the number of launches on the y-axis and the time in the x-axis. The question is, during which year of this time period was the number of space shuttle launches the greatest? So given that the number of launches is on the y-axis, we're simply looking for the highest point which is over here where they had nine launches and that occurred in 1985. So that's the answer. We're not looking for the greatest rate of change. We're not looking for an increase or a decrease. We're just looking for the greatest number of space shuttle launches. So it's a very easy question. Question three, American marsupials and Australian marsupials are the two primary groups of marsupials. The table shows the number of species in each order of living marsupial by group. So we've got American and Australian, and then each order, and the number of species. Based on the table, what fraction of the Australian marsupial species are from the order Paramolomorphia? So really, we're just concerned with this group, that's the Australian, and they want to know what fraction are from here. So your numerator is going to be 24, obviously, and so are all the answers, cross off choice D. And for the denominator, you basically have to add 1 plus 71 plus 24 plus 2 plus 137. So do that on your calculator real quick, and you're going to get 235. And so the answer is going to be B. Question 4. We have a graph. 10 data points are in the scatter plot shown, along with a line of best fit. Which of the following best estimates the predicted value of y when x equals 6.5? So when x equals 6.5, we find that the line is right over here, and the y value that's predicted by the line is going to be 16. So that's the answer. Notice that when x equals 6.5, we actually don't have any data points. We only have points on, it looks like, the whole numbers, when x equals 5, when x equals 6, when x equals 7. So that's one reason why the line of best fit actually helps us to predict things. Question 5. What is 120% of 2,000? So given that this is calculator, the fastest way to do this is to multiply 1.2 times 2,000 on your calculator, and then you're going to get 2,400, so C is the answer. If you wanted to do this in your head, I'd say first calculate 20% of 2,000. 20% of 2,000 is 1 -fifth, so 1 -fifth of 2,000 is going to be 400, just like 1 -fifth of 20 is 4. And then, given that they want 120%, you're adding on that 20% to the original 2,000, so it's going to be 400 plus 2,000 equals 2,400. Question six, a field has a perimeter of 960 feet of the following, which is closest to the perimeter of the field in meters? And then they tell us one foot is equal to 0 0.3 meters. You can actually just eyeball this question, given that for every one foot, it's about one third of a meter. Given that you have 960 feet, you want to take roughly one third, which is going to be like 320. So the closest answer to that is going to be 290, and that's the uh, answer to the question. Now, if you weren't sure or you didn't recognize that, you could set up a proportion. You can say one foot is equal to 0 0.3048 meters, and that's going to equal, on the other side, 960 feet is equal to how many meters? Cross multiply, divide by 1, and you're going to get x equals 292. 0.68. But given that all the answers were rough estimates, they probably did not want you to do that. Question 7. Automobile insurance in a U.S. city. We have a box and whisker plot. It says, the box plot summarizes the data for the annual cost of automobile insurance for automobile owners in a certain U.S. city. Which of the following could be the median annual cost of, an autom of automobile insurance for automobile owners in this city? So when you're looking at a box plot, basically you just have to know a few things. Right over here is the minimum value. Right over here is the maximum value. Right in the middle of the box is the median. So that's what they're asking for. And since that's around a little over 1600, A is going to be the answer. Other information that is useful, 
right over here, the leftmost part of the box is the 25th percentile. The rightmost part of the box is the 75th percentile. They sometimes call that Q1, the lower quartile, and they sometimes call this Q3, the upper quartile. In between Q1 and Q3 is what's called the interquartile range. Now on the SAT, most likely you'll just have to know minimum, maximum, median, 25th and 75th percentile, and that should enable you to get the answer. Question eight, the table lists selected values of Sam's walking speed in kilometers per hour and his corresponding pulse in beats per minute. There's a linear relationship between Sam's speed and his pulse. Which of the following describes f of x? So speed is gonna be our x value, pulse, is f of x or our y value. So notice that all the equations are equations of a line, which makes sense because these are, uh, this is a linear relationship. And notice that as the speed increases, four, six, eight, so does the pulse, which tells us that the slope is gonna be positive. So automatically we can eliminate choices B and choices D because they have a negative slope right over here. You know, we're using y equals mx plus b form. And out of choices A and C, they both have the same y-intercept, 57. So we really have to figure out, is the slope 1 or is the slope 5? So there are two ways you can do it. You could simply just plug in numbers and see what works. Uh, that might be the faster way, so let's do that. So let's take this value, and we're going to plug that into A. f of x equals 77. Is that equal to 4 plus 57? The answer is no, and so that means C has to be the answer. Just to double check, we're going to say... 77 equals 5 times 4 plus 57, which is 20 plus 57, so that definitely works. Now, if you wanted to calculate the slope directly, you could just take any two values. So I'm going to use these two. So remember, slope is change in y over change in x. So 87 minus 77, and we're going to divide that by 6 minus 4. That becomes 10 over 2, and so we find out that the slope is indeed 5, and so C is the answer. Question 9. Based on the 2010 U.S. Census, the population of Milwaukee was about 96% the population of Baltimore. In 2010, if Milwaukee's population was 595,000, which is the best approximation of Baltimore's population? So they're asking for the best approximation, which means we can probably do it in our head. So if we know that Milwaukee's population was 595,000 and it's 96% of Baltimore's, then we're looking for something that's a little bit bigger than 595,000. And the only choice that really works is choice A, because everything else is smaller than 595,000. Now, if you wanted to do this maybe the real way, you can set up an equation. You can say 595,000, that's Milwaukee, is equal to 96%, that's 0 0.96 of Baltimore. We don't know Baltimore, so that's our x. When you divide 595,000 by 0 0.96, you're going to get 619.791, which is very close to choice A. But you really didn't need to do this if you kind of just glance at the answers real quick. Question 10. In 1855, Louis Remy traveled from Sacramento to Portland stopping to rest for only 10 hours of the 143 hours it took him to reach Portland. If his average speed while traveling without resting was five miles per hour, how many miles did he travel? So the relationship we're gonna keep in mind is distance equals rate times time. And the distance is what they're asking for. So what's the rate? It says it was five miles per hour. And what is the time? The total was 143 and he rested for 10. That means he was really moving for 133 hours. So five times 133 is gonna give us choice A, which is 665, and that's what the distance is. Question 11 says, each of the 25 data values in the data set is a different integer between one and 50 inclusive. The table gives the frequency of the data for five intervals. Which of the following intervals contains exactly two-fifths of the values in the data set? Given that we know that the total is 25, they want to know two-fifths of 25. So if you do it in your head, one-fifth of 25 is 5, so two-fifths of 25 is going to be 10. So they're asking which of these intervals that they give us contains exactly 10. So we can go through it, 1 through 20. Notice what they're doing is they're including 
two intervals. So 1 through 20 is going to be 7 plus 5 is 12, not 10. 11 through 30, 5 plus 3 is 8, not 10. 21 to 40, it's going to be 3 plus 8 is 11. So 31 to 50 is 10, and that's the answer. Question 12, it says the table above shows the distribution of the number of extracurricular activities that students at a middle school participate in. If the number of students who participate in two extracurricular activities is 120 more than the number of students who participate in one extracurricular activity, what is the total number of students who attend the middle school? So the basic principle that you have to keep in mind here is that if you know a percent and its corresponding number of students, you automatically can figure out any other uh, question that they're asking. You can automatically figure out the total number of students. You can figure out any other percent of students. So for example, if you know that 10% of the students is exactly 25 students, you automatically know that the total student body is 250. So here we're going to do something very similar. It says the number of students who participate in two activities is 120 more than the number of students who participate in one activity. What is the difference in percentage? It's going to be 55 minus 30, which gives you 25% of the students. So if you know 120 students is equal to 25%, then you can just set up a very simple equation. 0 0.25 times x equals 120. And then you're going to divide both sides by 0.25, and x is going to equal 480. Alternatively, you know 120 students is equal to 25%. So therefore, how many students is equal to 100%? And it's going to be the same math. You multiply 120 by 100, divide by 25, you're going to get x also equals 480. Now, another way to do this problem is probably the more formal way. So again, if we know that the number of students who participate in two activities is 120 more than the, one who's, than the number of students who participate in one activity, we could turn that into algebra directly. So the number of students who participate in one activity is going to be 0 0.3 times x, which is the total, plus 120 is going to equal 0 0.55 times x. If we subtract 0.3 from both sides, we're going to get 0.25x. And then again, it's the same algebra. We're taking 120 divided by 0.25, and the answer is going to be 480. Lastly, if you weren't able to think of either of those two methods, the other way you can do this is by working backwards. So the question is asking, what is the total number of students? So if you look at choice A, let's assume that 240 is the total number of students. So all we have to do is calculate what is 55% of 240, that's 0 0.55 times 240. And then what is 30% of 240, 0 0.30 of 240. Calculate those numbers and then subtract the two and see if you get 120. So I'll show you how that works for the right answer, which is choice B. So if you take 480 and you go 0 0.55 times 480, and then 0 0.3 times 480, the numbers you get are 264 and 144. And if you subtract those, then you're going to get 120, which is what the difference is. Question 13, we have a graph without a line of best fit, interestingly. It says, for her job, Natasha spent a total of n minutes processing ID card applications and driver's license applications. It takes Natasha 15 minutes to process an ID card application and 20 minutes to process a driver's license application. The graph above represents all possible combinations for the number of ID card applications and the number of driver's license applications that Natasha could have processed in n minutes. What is the value of n? All right, so let's keep in mind that it takes her 15 minutes to process ID cards, so we're going to put that down here, and it takes her 20 minutes to process driver's licenses. Given that each point is all the possible combinations of the numbers of IDs and driver's license she can process, if they just want to know the time that it takes her, the easiest points to pick are either over here, where she's processing 36 ID cards and zero driver's licenses, 
or up here where she's processing 27 driver's licenses and zero ID card. The reason that those two are the best points to pick is because you only have to do one calculation. So for example, if she's processing 36 ID cards and they each take her 15 minutes, 36 times 15 is going to give you 540 and that's the answer. Likewise, if you pick this point and she's processing 27 driver's license applications and they're each taking her 20 minutes, 27 times 20 is 540. Alternatively, we could pick a random point, say right here, and over here she's processing 12 ID cards that are taking her 15 minutes each. So 12 times 15 is 180 and she's processing 18 driver's licenses which are taking her 20 minutes each. 18 times 20 is 360 and if you add up the times you're also going to get 540. So no matter which point you pick you're always going to get 540 as long as you don't mix up your numbers and the times that it takes. Question 14. In the xy plane, what is the y coordinate of the y intercept of the graph of the equation? That. So on any graph, your y intercept is where it crosses the y axis, and at that point, the x coordinate is always going to be 0. So all we have to do is plug in x equals 0, and then see what we get for y, and that'll be the y coordinate of the y intercept. So 3 times 0 is 0 minus 12, and then x is 0, so it becomes 0 plus 2. 0 minus 12 is negative 12 divided by positive 2, and that's going to be negative 6, and that is the answer. Question 15. The coordinates of points A, B, and C are shown in the xy plane above. For which of the following inequalities will each of the points A, B, and C be contained in the solution region? So one way to do this problem is to basically take each point A, B, and C and plug them into each answer choice. And then you're looking for the answer choice that stays true for all three points. That kind of takes a lot of time, so I don't really advise doing that unless you can't think of any other way. What I'm going to do instead is do a rough sketch of each of these graphs and then see which one looks like it'll include all three points. So the way to do that is first remember that we're looking at linear equations. So they're generally all lines. So if we think of this as y equals negative x minus 2, we know exactly what that line looks like. Um, the y-intercept is at negative 2. It has a slope of negative 1. So that means it's going to cross the y-axis here and the x-axis right about there. And that's the line. But since it says y is greater, that means our solution set is going to be all the points that are above the line. So choice A right now does look like it includes all three points. So that's likely going to be the answer, and we'll keep it. For choice B, we're thinking about what does the line y equals negative x look like? So obviously the y-intercept here is 0, it's at the origin, and it also has a slope of 1. So this line is going to be right over here. And since it says greater, we're also including this region, but notice that we're not including point A. So choice B is going to be out. Choice C, we're thinking of the line y equals x plus 3. So that's going to be y-intercept over here and the line is has a slope of positive 1 so it's going to look like that and since the inequality is y is less than that the solution set is going to be over here now that looks like it might include all three the way that you really test that out is you want to plug in point a so that's going to be 1 is less than negative 2 plus 3 and obviously when we do that 1 is not less than 1 this solution would work if it said y is less than or equal to because apparently the point is exactly on the line but since the inequality is not including the line itself then choice c is also out lastly choice d x is equal to three lastly choice d x is equal to three that's going to be a vertical line like this and the inequality is less than, so it's going to go this way. Notice we have the same situation. We know that point B is on the line, but it's not included in the solution set because it's x is less than 3 and not less than or equal to 3. By the way, for choices A, C, and D, I really should have drawn dotted lines because that's how you signify that the line itself is not included in the solution set. But regardless, D is out and A is going to be the answer. 
Question 16. In the figure above, AB equals AD, BC equals CD, BE equals 2, BC equals 4, and AC equals 10. I'm just going to write that down here so it doesn't get in the way. What is the area of triangle ABD? So the first thing that I'm going to notice is that because AB is congruent to AD and BC is congruent to BD, when you draw these two lines, you're actually making a right angle. So we're really looking at a bunch of right triangles. Now, the strategy to get this area is we know the base because if this is 2, this is 2 also. It's perfectly symmetrical. We just need the height. We know AC is 10, so if we can get length EC, then we'll just subtract it from 10, and then we'll have all the information that we need. What you may notice very quickly is that this is actually a 30, 60, 90 triangle. Also, the clue is you see a bunch of rad threes here, but because the shorter leg is two and the hypotenuse is four, I know that the longer leg is two rad three. The reason I know that is because I memorized that a 30, 60, 90 triangle has proportions one rad three and two. And so that fits into this by saying two, two rad three and four. If that's confusing, you can do a proportion. If you didn't know that, you could have used the Pythagorean theorem, which is going to say 2 squared plus EC squared equals 4 squared. So that's 4 plus EC squared equals 16. EC squared is going to give you 12. EC is therefore rad 12. And when you simplify rad 12, it becomes 2 rad 3 because rad 12 is really rad 4 times rad 3, and then rad 4 becomes 2. So given that EC is 2 rad 3, that means AE is going to be 10 minus 2 rad 3. And now I have enough information to find the area of my triangle, because I know the area of a triangle is 1 half base times height. Base is 4, and height is 10 minus 2 rad 3. So 1 half of 4 is 2 times 10 minus 2 rad 3. And 2 times 10 is 20 minus 4 rad 3. And therefore, the answer is going to be C. Question 17. The graph above shows the distribution of the number of years of experience for 25 teachers in an advanced degree program at a particular university. If a 26 teacher with two years of experience is added, what will the effect be on the mean and median of the data set? So I think it's easier to do the median first. So let's calculate the median. Basically, if we know that there are a total of 25 teachers, that's an odd number. So the median is the middle term, which is the 13th term. So where is the 13th term going to happen? Well, you can calculate it very quickly just by marking out the number. So we have four teachers with one year of experience seven teachers with two years of experience and eight teachers with three years of experience, clearly the median is going to be three because the 13th teacher is going to be somewhere in here. Now, if that's hard for you to think about, you can uh, very quickly write it out so that there are four teachers with one year of experience. There are seven teachers with two years of experience two, three, four, five, six, seven. And then there are eight teachers with three years of experience. I'm not going to write all of them out. But if I count one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13 is right here. And so 13 is my middle number in this entire list. So that's how I know that the median is three. Now the question is, what's going to happen if I add another teacher who had two years of experience into this list. So now we have another teacher, and I'm going to put a two right here because that's our new teacher. What's going to happen to the new median? Given that this teacher is the 26th teacher, the new median is going to be exactly between the 13th and the 14th item. So if we added an item here and we counted, what we're going to find is that this three now becomes the 13th item, and this three 
now becomes the 14th item. So the median of this new data set is going to be right between 13 and 14, or simply the average of 13 and 14. The average of 3 and 3 is also going to be 3. So the new median is going to equal 3, and the median doesn't change. That means we can cross out choice A, and we can cross out choice D. Now we're going to calculate the mean for the original data set. So let's keep doing what we did over here. We have four teachers with four years of experience, and then we have two teachers with five years of experience. So if we multiply these numbers together, we're going to get our totals. So four times one is four, plus seven times two is 14, plus three times eight is 24, plus four times four is 16, plus five times two is 10. And that's the total number of years of experience. And we're going to divide that by the number of teachers, which is 25. And when we do that on our calculator, we're going to find that the mean is about 2.72. So if we added another teacher, the 26 teacher, with two years of experience, given that the mean is 2.72, another data point with two is going to drive the mean down. And so it's going to decrease. So that means choice B is off, and the answer is going to be choice C. Notice that we don't have to recalculate the mean because they're not asking us for what the new mean is. They're really only asking us for how the mean is going to change. So question 18. A sports store had 60 backpacks in stock, some with wheels and some without wheels, before a new shipment of backpacks arrived. The number of wheeled backpacks in the new shipment was twice the number of wheeled backpacks already in stock. The number of backpacks without wheels in the new shipment was five times the number of backpacks without wheels already in stock. After the new shipment arrived, there were 330 backpacks in the store. Before the shipment, there were X-wheeled backpacks and Y backpacks without wheels. Which of the following equations can be used with X plus Y equals 60 to solve for X and Y? All right, so X plus Y equals 60. That's the equation that we're starting with. And we want to remember that x is associated with wheels and y is associated with no wheels. That's important because it tells us that in the new shipment, the number of backpacks with wheels became twice. So we're going to actually multiply x by 2. And it also tells us that the number of no wheeled backpacks in the new shipment was five times the number of no wheeled backpacks. So that's why we're multiplying x by 2 and y by 5 and we could automatically eliminate c and d. Now when you're looking at the answer choices the question is is this equation which is what the answer is should that be 330 or 270? Well notice what it says after the new shipment arrived there were 330 backpacks so that actually includes the old backpacks and the new backpacks. So the new total is going to be 330. So what is the number of new backpacks? It's going to be 330 minus 60, which is 270. And this is the useful equation that we want. And so that's why the answer is B. If you wanted to do this out and see how it makes sense, it would be 3x plus 6y equals 330. But the key here was write in 330 down here and not in here, which is what they wanted for choice A. Question 19. The function h is defined as shown for what value of x does h reach its minimum value? So what you should recognize automatically is that h of x is actually a parabola because when you multiply this out, you get x squared minus 25. And if you know for the parabola, the standard form is going to be ax squared plus bx plus 25. That's one form of the parabola. And given this form, the way that you get the x-coordinate of the vertex is it's negative b over 2a. So in this particular equation, we have no b term because it's 0. And the a term is 1. But regardless, it's going to be 0. And so the x-coordinate of the vertex, where it reaches its minimum value, is going to be 0. Now you might have noticed automatically that this is a parabola and this is actually in a more useful form because we know that there's an implied coefficient one here so the parabola opens upward 
And if the zeros of the parabola are 5 and negative 5, keeping in mind that parabolas are symmetrical, we know that it's going to cross the axis at 5 and negative 5. So this is 5, this is negative 5. And the vertex is going to be right on the y-axis. And so anything on the y-axis has a, an x-coordinate of 0. So that's another way that you could have um, done this very quickly just by looking at it. Question 20. A set of data is represented by the scatter plot in the portion of the xy plane shown. Which of the following linear equations best fits the data? So glancing at the answer choices, because it says which of the following, what I'm going to notice is that they're really forcing us to make two choices. Number one, is the slope 1.6 or is it 16? Number two, is the y-intercept either positive or negative 15.2? The first thing that I'll notice is that this is not the true origin because this is 90 and this is 5. The origin is going to be somewhere way over here, so it's actually going to be hard to just estimate the y-intercept. So I'm going to try to calculate the slope first based on the data, and then hopefully the y-intercept, we can plug in numbers to figure it out. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to draw my own approximate line of best fit, and we'll do like that and it's probably a little bit low. So I'm going to pick these two points and I'm going to try to calculate the slope by doing rise over run. So I have 125 minus 100, so we know that this distance is 25. And then I have 6.8 minus 5.6, so that's 1.2. When I calculate that slope, 25 divided by 1.2, I'm going to get approximately 20. Now what that tells me is that the slope is definitely not 1.6. It's closer to 16x. The reason it's not exactly 16 is probably because the points that I picked would not exactly be on the line. So now I have to figure out what the y-intercept is. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to use one of my test points, plug it in, and see which one works. So let's take this point up here, which is 6.8 comma 125. And we're going to plug that into C and D and see which one works. So 125 equals negative 15.2 plus 16 times 6.8. 16 times 6.8 is 108. If we add that to negative 15.2, clearly that's not going to give us 125 because it's going to make the number smaller. So C is not the answer. D is actually the same equation, but instead of a negative 15.2, we're adding it. So think about adding 15.2 to 108. Yeah, that's going to get us a lot closer to 125. So that tells us that D is the right answer, both because the slope is close to what we calculated and because the y-intercept is close to what we calculated based on our given point. 21. An equation in the graph is ax plus by equals 6. a and b are constants. What is the value of b? So since they're showing us what the graph actually is, you can probably just pick two points on it and then plug in for x and y, and you can solve for a and b. So I'm going to pick 0, negative 2, and that's actually the fastest, because when you plug that in, it becomes a times 0 plus b times negative 2 equals 6. The a term drops out. This is negative 2b equals 6 b equals negative 3. So that's the answer. Alternatively, the other easy points would be 6, 0, and 3, negative 1. And if you were to plug those into the equation, it would just be a times 6 plus b times 0 equals 6, and then a times 3 plus b times negative 1 equals 6. And then solve for a here, plug that in here, solve for b, you're also going to get negative 3. But noticing that 0, 2, negative 2 is, um, will make the a term drop out is actually the fastest. 22. The function w gives the estimated weight in pounds of a rainbow trout based on its length in inches. Which of the following is the best interpretation of the number 1.22 in this context? So this is actually a very standard form. It's actually a compound interest type of formula. And if you know how the formula works, you can pretty much just get the answer right away by looking at it. The first thing we'll notice is that 
L is defined as a length. So that's the only thing that's changing in terms of the variables. So it can't be choice A and it can't be choice uh, C because those are both weight. The only question is, does the 1.22 mean we're increasing by 22% or we're increasing by 1.22 pounds? 0 0.04, by the way, is completely arbitrary. That's basically the starting value or the starting number. The real question is, what is multiplying the starting weight by 1.22 due to it? And I know it's a 22% increase because let's say I were to try to find 22% of a number, you know you would multiply by 0.22x. If you wanted to find the new value when you add 22% to the original, you just add it to the original. And notice what happens if I factor out an x, I get 0 0.22 plus 1. And so to get the new value when you add 22% to the original, you're really just multiplying the original by 1.22. That tells me that the answer is B. So for the SAT, you should be able to do this very quickly. Like a 30% increase, you multiply by 1.3. A 5% increase, you multiply by 1.05. A 30% decrease, keep in mind you're left with 70%, so you have to multiply by 0.7. A 5% decrease, you're left with 95%, so you multiply by 0.95. So you should be able to do this very quickly. The only other thing to think about is choice D. What would the equation look like if the weight increased by 1.22 pounds? You would start with the original weight. That doesn't change, but you're adding 1.22 pounds. And if that number increases for every one inch in length, you would just stick the variable on the end. Um, so 2 inches in length, you'd add 1.22 times 2, or 2 times 3 times 3, and so on. So that's what it would look like if choice D were the answer. Number 23, in the figure, theta is an angle. If the sine of theta is rad 3 over 2, what is the cosine of theta? All right, so if you've taken trig, you should really know that you only need to memorize about three triangles, really two and you should be able to get any trig question. So assuming the hypotenuse is one, because we're in the unit circle, the sine of 30 is always gonna be one half. The cosine of 30 is always gonna be rad three over two. You should also know a 60 degree triangle, which is really 30 degree triangle flipped. The sine is rad three over two. The cosine is always one half. And the last triangle you should know is a 45, 45, 90 triangle. The sine is always rad 2 over 2, and the cosine is rad 2 over 2. In this case, if the sine of theta is rad 3 over 2, that means my reference angle over here is going to be 60 degrees, because that would give me rad 3 over 2 here. And then the, co the cosine of that angle is going to be 1 half. And the only difference is because we're in the um, second quadrant, cosine is always negative in quadrant two and quadrant three because remember, cosine is the x component of the reference triangle. So that's why the answer is negative one half. The two-way table categorizes the change in value in July and August for 50 stocks. If one of the stocks that increased in value in August is chosen at random, so that's this row, 21 plus 9 equals 30. What is the probability that stock also increased in value in July? So that's this column, 21 plus 4 equals 25. And here's where the intersection is. But we're only considering the ones that increased in August, which is a total of 30. And out of that 30, the ones that increased in July or 21. So 21 divided by 30, that's a little more than two thirds. So that's why the answer is 0 0.7. 25. Mineta drove 390 miles. Part of the drive was along local roads where his speed was 20 miles per hour. The rest was along a highway where his speed was 60 miles per hour. The drive took eight hours. What distance did he drive along the local roads? 
So you might be tempted to think that because he drove 20 on the local roads and 60 on the highways, that his distance is gonna be in the same proportions. That would only be true if he were driving 20 miles and 60 miles each for the exact same amount of time. We don't know that. All we know is that his total distance is 390 and his total time is eight hours. So I recommend if you have no idea what's going on here, just plug in numbers. You're obviously gonna to have to use some form of the distance equals rate times times formula. So let me show you how to do that real quick. Choice A, if he drove a total of 30 miles going uh, 20 miles per hour, you can actually divide 30 miles by 20 miles per hour to get the total time that he drove and that's going to be 1.5 hours. So if he drove 1.5 hours going 20 miles per hour, subtract that from 8 and then we get 6.5 hours where he was driving 60 miles per hour. Multiply those together on your calculator and you'll get that he actually spent 390 miles going 6.5. So 390 plus 30 doesn't make sense because that's 420 and that's more than 390. So these numbers don't work out based on what the problem is saying and A is out. So we have to try choice B. So if he drove 45 miles at a speed of 20 miles per hour, that means he spent 2.25 hours on the local roads and subtract that from eight we get 5.75 hours on the highways and his speed along the highway was 60 miles per hour so multiply the time times the speed to get the distance what you'll find is that the end the distance that he was driving on the highways was 345 345 plus 45 that adds up to 390 B actually does make sense with all the numbers and that's why it's the answer. Now if you want to do this the real way, you're going to have to come up with some type of equation that relates all the uh, information together. So given that we're looking for distance, I'm going to make an equation that puts everything in terms of distance. So we're going to say distance 1 plus distance 2 equals the total of 390. And we're arbitrarily going to say that distance 1 is the amount of time that he was on the highway. So since distance equals rate times time, it's going to be 60, and I'm going to use t for time. Distance 2, he was driving for 20 miles per hour. I'm not going to put another variable here because then I won't be able to solve it. But because I know the total time was 8 hours, I can write 8 minus t, and that's the same t as over here, for the amount of time he was driving locally, all equals 390. So 60t plus 160 minus 20t equals 390. This becomes 40t, subtract 160 from both sides, you get 230t in this case turns out to be 5.75. And remember, we're looking for the distance that he drove on the local roads, which we arbitrarily assigned as d2. So we just have to plug in our value of t d2 is 20 times 8 minus t so that becomes 20 times 8 minus 5.75 do that on your calculator d2 works out to be 45 so that's the distance that he was traveling along the local roads 26 in the quadratic equation shown b is a constant for what value of b does the equation have only one solution so if you want to know about the nature of the solutions, the easiest thing is to use the discriminant. Remember, the discriminant comes from the quadratic formula. So that's negative b plus minus square root b squared minus 4ac all over 2a. And given the discriminant's placement in the quadratic formula, it's going to determine what the roots are. Because if b squared minus 4ac is greater than zero. Notice you're taking the square root of a positive number, so you're still going to have two equations, negative b plus that number, negative b minus that number. So you're going to have two real roots, and what that's going to look like is that the parabola is going to cross the x-axis in two places. If b squared minus 4ac is less than zero, 
you're taking the square root of a negative number and you're gonna have two imaginary roots. Visually, that means your parabola is not gonna have real solutions. It's not gonna intersect the x-axis. If on the other hand, b squared minus four ac is equal to zero, notice what's gonna happen. It's the square root of zero, which is zero. So that whole term drops out and you're only left with negative b over two a. You're gonna have one real root and that's going to be shown by a parabola that touches the x-axis exactly on its vertex. So let's use the discriminant and see what we're dealing with. If we want only one solution, we're going to set it equal to 0. b, we don't know. b squared minus 4. a is 1. c is 16. And that equals 0. So that becomes b squared minus 64 equals 0 b squared equals 64, square root both sides, b equals plus minus 8. And those are the values of b that make the discriminant equal to 0, and therefore the whole quadratic equation have only one root. Let's say you forgot about the discriminant, or you're like, what does that word even mean? The other way you could have done that is by plugging in these values for b and seeing which one um, gives you no solution. You could kind of approach it like this. For a quadratic equation to have only one solution, the factors have to be identical. So in this case, it's actually easy because 16 is a perfect square. So you know that x plus 4 times x plus 4 will give you x squared plus 8x plus 16 equals 0. So b in this case is positive 8. What you also had to recognize is x minus 4 times x minus 4 will also give you positive 16, but here it'll be negative 8x. And then, so your b term here is negative 8, and that's why the answer is d. 27. The function f is defined for all real numbers, and the graph y equals f of x is a line with a negative slope. Which of the following must be true? So notice that we have to consider given x values and their corresponding y values. So likely we'll have to consider three cases, one where the line crosses the origin, another where the line is to the right or above the origin, and a third where the line is to the left or below the origin. If the problem were more complicated, they could ask questions based on how steep or shallow the line is, but it doesn't look like they're doing that. So number one, if a is less than b, then is f of a greater than f of b? So let's take a given a, and we'll take a given b, and that puts us right here on the line, and then right here on the line, which means this is f of a, and down here is f of b. So given that a is less than b, is f of a greater than f of b? Yeah, it definitely looks like that. And that's probably going to be true no matter what two values we pick for a and b because the line is always slanted this way. So for now, we'll say that 1 is true and we'll cross out choice b. Number 2, if a is less than 0, then f of a is greater than 0. So immediately you can see that this is not true right over here because if a is less than 0, f of a is about over here which is negative, and so two is not true. Number three, if a is greater than zero, then the y value is less than zero. This is obviously not true here, because when a is greater than zero, f of a is gonna be about here, and that's clearly positive, and so that's why number three doesn't work. So the answer is one only. Number 28, in the equation above, a and b are positive constants, a is not equal to b, how many distinct x-intercepts does the graph have? So an x-intercept is where the graph crosses the x-axis, or algebraically, y is going to be equal to 0. So keep in mind that we're looking at an equation with seven factors multiplied together. We want to make y equals 0. Any one of them can be 0 for that to happen. So the first way would be if x were to equal to 0. In this factor, for this to be equal to 0, x would have to be equal to a. Same thing here. In this factor, x would have to be equal to negative b. And here, x would have to be equal to positive b. So how many distinct factors are there? 1, 2, 3, 4, and that's the answer. 
Now, if you wanted to see what that would look like worked out algebraically, it would look like this, and you can see we have four distinct roots. 29. In the given equation, k is a constant. If the equation has no solution, what is the value of k? So I think the easiest way to do this is take all these potential values of k, plug them into the equation, and see which one gives you no solution. To make this easier, I'm going to multiply both sides by 3. x minus k equals 3kx. And now I'm going to plug each of these in for k. So choice A, this becomes x plus 1 equals negative 3x. This is easily solvable. Subtract x from both sides. You get 1 equals negative 4x. Choice B, plugging that in for k, you get x plus 1 third equals negative x. This one is also solvable. So subtract x from both sides. You get 1 third equals negative 2x. Choice C, plug 0 in. You get x minus 0 equals 0. So that's your solution. Choice D, you plug in a third. x minus 1 third equals 1 third of 3. You're left with x. And here what you'll notice is if you subtract x from both sides, you're left with negative a third equals zero, which doesn't make sense, and that's why d is the answer. If you wanted to do this problem the real way, you can isolate x and then analyze it and see what values of k would make x undefined. So we're going to do the same thing. We're going to multiply the equation on both sides by 3. We're going to get x minus k equals 3kx. I'm going to subtract x from both sides, which is going to leave me negative k equals 3kx minus x. Since we're trying to isolate x, we're going to factor out an x, which is going to be 3k minus 1 equals negative k. Divide both sides by negative 3k minus 1. That gives us negative k over 3k minus 1 equals x. And when you're looking at this, for x to be undefined, you can't divide by 0. So if 3k minus 1 were equal to 0, that would work. Add 1 to both sides, 3k equals 1, divide by 3, k equals 1 third. So when k is 1 third, x becomes undefined, and therefore the equation has no solution. Number 30, the expressions that and that where b and c are constants, are equivalent, what is the value of b plus c? So the first thing you'll notice is that we're looking at two quadratics. So to make this problem easier, I'm going to multiply out the second one and then set it equal to the first. So that becomes x squared minus 6x plus 9 plus c. Now if the whole left side is equal to the whole right side, it stands to reason that each individual part is going to be equal. So the linear terms are equal. And then the constants should also be equal. And I'm just going to set them equal to each other. bx equals negative 6x. Divide both sides by x. We get b equals negative 6. Here, 10 is equal to 9 plus c because they're both constants. Subtract 9 from both sides. We get c is equal to 1. b plus c, negative 6 plus 1, is going to be negative 5. And that's your answer. 31. What value of x makes the above equation true? So you can just eyeball this. The only thing raised to the fourth power that's going to give you 0 is 0. So x minus 3 equals 0. x is obviously going to be 3, and that's the answer. 32. In the data set shown, r is an integer. If the median of the data set is 8, r is less than 11, what is a possible value of r? So since we're talking about the median, get it into numerical order. 4, 5, 5, 8, 11, and 13. So you know with r added, we're dealing with seven numbers. For 8 to still be the median, there's got to be 3 on each side to keep it the middle number. And if r is less than 11, it's going to go right in here. So what are the integer possibilities for r to be less than 11 and 8 to stay the median? 10, obviously. 9 is another one. But don't forget 8, because even if you have another 8 inside here, this 8 is still going to stay in the middle, and it's going to be the median. So your answers are 8, 9, or 10. 33. 
x, y is the solution of the system of equations. What is the value of x? So the easiest way to solve this is by elimination because I see that both equations have a one y in them. So I'm gonna subtract the first equation from the second and eight minus four x equals four x, y minus y equals zero, five minus four equals one. Solve for x, you get one fourth and that's the answer. 34. One serving of microwave popcorn provides 150 calories, 90 from fat. One serving of pretzels provides 120 calories, 12 from fat. How many more calories from fat are provided by a 100 calorie serving of popcorn than a 100 calorie serving of the pretzels? So the strategy here is gonna figure out how much fat you get from 100 from each of them and then compare. So if we get 150, calorie popcorn and 90 is from fat. How much fat do we get from 100 serving? Do that on your calculator. You're going to find that x equals 60. And now we're going to do pretzels. Out of 120 calories from pretzels, 12 are from fat. How much fat are we going to get if the serving is 100? Same idea. Do that on your calculator. x is 10. So the difference between the two is 60 minus 10, which is 50. And that's the answer. 35, the length in meters of the sides and height of a parallelogram are shown. What is the area in square meters? So area of a parallelogram is always base times height because if you were to translate this triangle over here, then you'd be looking at a rectangle still with base 10 and height five. So five times 10 is 50 and that's your answer. 36, the linear function f is defined by f of x equals cx plus d. C and d are constants f of 50 equals 27,000, f of 100 equals 38,000. So the first thing to do is keep in mind what we're looking at. x is the variable, as it always is. c and d are constants, which means they are numbers that we're going to have to figure out. And they're giving us information in two cases, one where x is 50 and the other where x is 100. So let's plug those in and see if we have enough information to solve for c and d. So the first one, f of 50 equals 27,000. I'm going to say 27,000 equals c times 50, that's 50c, plus d. And the second equation, 38,000, it's very similar, is going to be 100c plus d. So now keep in mind we have two equations with two unknowns, and that's enough to solve because any given number of unknowns, we need the same number of equations. Um, that are different, and we have that here. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to subtract the first equation from the second, because that's easier. 100c minus 50c is going to be 50c. d minus d is 0. 38,000 minus 27,000 is 11,000. Divide by 50 on both sides. c is going to be 220, and that's going to be my answer. Keep in mind, we could plug c back in to solve for d in any of these. But since they're not asking for D, we don't have to. 37 and 38 have to do with this graph. A large company has 19 mainframe computers. The scatter plot shows the value and age for each of the 19 computers and a line of best fit is shown. So that makes sense. Value is here, age is here. And we expect that as age increases, value goes down. Number 37, based on the line of best fit, the estimated value of a six year old computer is K thousand dollars, where K is an integer, what is the value of K? So six years old, we're looking right here and we care only about what's on this line. The estimated value is gonna be $15,000 and that's the same as K thousand, so K in this case is 15. 38, what is the number of computers for which the line of best fit predicts a value less than the actual value. That basically means how many times is the line below the dots, which are the actual value. So what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna count the number of dots that are above the line, and that'll be the answer. So I've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, and nine is your answer.